Good morning and welcome to this AHDB webinar, which today will focus on the EU exit and the red meat trade and the reality three months on. This is a follow up session to one we ran uh, just before the Christmas period, and it really reflects on what's happened in the meantime. And we've assembled the uh, previous speakers and some new additions to reflect on the changes that have occurred <coughs> excuse me, in the uh, in the three months. So I'm Phil Hadley. I'm International Director for AHDB, responsible for our overseas activity. And we have a number of speakers today. Well, as speakers and a panel, I'll just introduce them very briefly. Uh, Tanya gesto Casas, who is our EU Policy Manager based in the AHDB office in Brussels. Rizvan Khalid, who's Managing Director of Euro Quality Lands uh, and Exports to Continental Europe. Knud Bull, who's a representative from the Danish Food and Agri Council, obviously European trade, um, both in and out for pig meat sector in particular. Uh, Cormac Healy, uh, representing the uh, red meat sector in the Republic of Ireland, and Ian Stevenson, representing uh, Northern Ireland. So a great collection of speakers. We have the opportunity for a panel and some reflection on thoughts. And I'd encourage you to feed in your questions via the chat bar to make sure that you can ask your questions of the speakers and we'll try our very best to get those into the conversation. So exports are a key area for AHDB, both in terms of the market access activity and the in-country trade development work that we do. We've had some good success of late uh, in the last few years on market access approval for new countries emerging markets for us, working in partnership with government and industry and successfully achieved new access to markets like the US, China and Japan. And of course, we remain very active on the market development front, the in-country work uh, across uh, our key strategic markets, including Asia, uh, North America uh, more latterly, and in particular Europe. Of course, Europe remains critical to the sectors uh, in terms of ongoing trade. So the Brexit discussions were obviously right at the top of the agenda. We have an office in France led by Remy Fourier and an extensive team of agents representing those key uh, European markets. Just before I hand over to Tanya, just uh, the housekeeping elements. As delegates, you're very welcome to this webinar and we appreciate your time to, to listen in. Hope you find it useful. And again, please pop your questions in the chat bar. You will stay muted throughout the webinar. Uh, and we're due to finish around 11.30 a.m. We'll have a, uh, a presentation and then a panel and the opportunity for questions. There'll be some polls throughout the session for you to give your views. They'll take uh, 30 seconds or more just to click on to get some uh, thoughts from the audience. The webinar will be recorded or is being recorded and will be published on YouTube after. So if you want to share that link with colleagues, please feel free to do so. And then just as we close, There'll be a survey at the end um, to ask you for your thoughts and reflections on that webinar. And we'd be really grateful if you'd just take a second before you depart to fill in that, uh, that survey. So without further delay, I shall hand over to our first speaker. Although actually I think, I just David, one more slide. Sorry, I've got a little bit ahead of myself. Uh, I just wanted to take a second uh, whilst um, have the opportunity to introduce the government's UK government's Open Doors campaign, which is promoting exports, particularly in the red meat and dairy sectors, to SME businesses uh, to encourage support and growth. Um, we as AHDB are a, a supporting partner, as indeed is the NFU and others. Um, red meat and dairy focused, the dairy webinar launched the programme last week and we have a red meat one scheduled for the 23rd of April. So please make a note in your diary because uh, that's relevant to this audience and click on or identify that link below uh, and you'll be able to get some more details and potentially participate in a launch of a mentor program. So um, I've just taken a second, I've stolen a moment from Tanya to, uh, um, to raise that. It, it is relevant uh, to red meat exporters, particularly in the SME sector. So Tanya, apologies. Uh, Tanya is our uh, policy manager in the AHDB office in Brussels, and she's going to set the scene in terms of the political dynamics, where we've come from, where we are now, and that will lead into the panel discussion uh, in a moment. So over to you, Tanya. Thank you very much. 
No problem. Hello, everyone. So, um, as been said, I'm Tania Gesto Casas, and I'm the policy manager in the AHDB Brussels office. And today, just going to review some of the main changes in the EU UK trade relationship since the last time we met for our first um, AHDB EU exit and red meat trade uh, webinar in November 2020. So, I know some of you uh, will be very familiar with what I'm going to present now. Uh, but the objective of this presentation is just to make sure that everyone in the audience is in the same page um, ahead of the panel discussion that we will have later today. So uh, next slide, please, David. So as I was saying, um, we hosted uh, our first EU exit and red meat webinar, red meat trade webinar in November. And uh, what has changed since then? Since then, well, one of the main changes is that the EU and the UK have finally um, managed to reach an agreement on their future relationship. So, in uh, very late in December, we had the the good news uh, that the agreement had been reached, uh, and then it was signed on the 30th of December, and it, uh, it's provisionally applying since the 1st of January 2021. And I say provisionally applying because uh, the EU has uh, has not ratified it yet, as they needed more time for the European Parliament to to scrutinize the deal. So now, at the moment, uh, uh, the European Parliament hasn't given its uh, consent yet. Uh, but there's a deadline for the ratification, and that deadline is the 30th of April. So hopefully that will happen in the coming uh, weeks. Then uh, the end of the year also meant the end of the transition period. And this is what Mr. Barnier used to call the, the economic Brexit, because the political and institutional Brexit happened in, in January 2020, when uh, the UK um, officially became a third country but now at the end of this year the uk also the end of sorry last year 2020 the uk also got out of the customs union and the single market and that has created a very different economic uh, reality and while we were all uh, very optimistic at the beginning of our of the year, given the, the massive achievement of having agreed a, a trade deal in just 11 months. Uh, the reality is that during the last few months, there have been a series of uh, tensions between the EU and the UK, and um, this, uh, the relationships have deteriorated a little due to different issues, including the vaccines debate and the challenges in the Northern Ireland, in Northern Ireland. and obviously, you know, um, these tensions on relationships always have an effect on trade. So next slide, please. But we are going to focus uh, on the bill itself. So the over 1,200 page long uh, trade and cooperation agreement um, reached by the parties governs the future rela uh, trading and security relationship between the EU and the UK now that the UK is um, is, is no longer a member of the EU. So you have in this slide a very uh, comprehensive um, graphic representation of, of what the deal covers. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of all of this, but just uh, to explain that uh, the deal has like three main pillars. So the first pillar is uh, the free trade agreement itself, covering trade in goods, services, and um, a broad range of other areas, such as investment, uh, transport, and sustainability. Then there's another pillar, uh, which is the new framework for law enforcement and um, judicial cooperation. And then a third one, which is uh, the horizontal agreement that you can see there in the slide on, on governance that provides clarity on how the agreement will be operated and controlled. Now, in addition, the deal is also supplemented by a series of unilateral measures in areas that are not, that were not covered by the negotiations. And these are areas such as UK third, third country um, SPS listings, uh, which is quite important because um, this is a requirement for uh, non-EU countries that need to be granted third country listing 
in order to be able to export certain agricultural products into the EU. Now, the UK government secured their country listing for a number of UK products, but there are some um, notable exceptions, and that's the case, for instance, of uh, fresh chilled meats. Uh, meat preparations that we can no longer export uh, to the EU. So next slide, please. We will be now uh, focusing on the free trade part of the deal. And uh, just first of all, just to clarify that the political ambition for uh, the ambition for this um, future trade relationship uh, was set out actually in the political declaration agreed by the parties in uh, October 2019 and in line with that uh, the, the one of the main achievements of, of this trade deal is that it provides for zero tariffs, zero quota between the parties and this has been obviously fantastic news for the agri for agricultural trade because uh, tariffs uh, in some uh, in some agricultural sectors would have been quite high and they would have led probably to um, threats to the viability of some producers and, and probably also to higher food prices in the UK. So good news that we have to deal, but we also need to, to bear in mind that any tariff-free arrangement is always subject to um, products complying with a new set of rules, uh, which have been in some cases quite challenging. And here I'm referring to, to, uh, to rules of origin. Uh, which are basically the criteria to establish where a product comes from. Now, another big achievement of the deal is that it provides for, uh, it preserves the regulatory autonomy of the parties, and this is um, this was a very important, especially for the UK side, because it means that both parties remain free to set their own uh, rules and, and legislations. And then, last uh, but not least, uh, the deal also provides, uh, also includes some level playing field clauses, including commitments to maintain high levels of protection in areas such as labor rights or environmental protection. This is important because it also um, includes uh, the possibility for the parties to take countermeasures in case uh, they feel that the other. Um, the other party has implemented a change that creates a competitive advantage and countermeasures, when I say countermeasures, uh, that can mean uh, reimposing tariffs, for instance. So very important. Uh, so next slide, please, David. So up to now, we've been talking about what the deal is and what it means, but it is also important to understand what the deal is not, and it is not business as usual. The UK, you know, being out of the single market and the customs union is now a third country, and there is no free, no free trade deal that can replicate the level of integration that we had uh, as part of the single market and the customs union. This means that there is no way to avoid a certain level of friction and we are seeing this in the form of checks and controls that are being implemented since they won in trade going from Great Britain to, to the EU. The deal does include an SBS chapter but it is relatively thin because there's no there's not really obligation to reduce level of order checks as regards SBS requirements so really that doesn't really make such a, a big difference. Um, in, in, in terms of uh, sanitary uh, controls. And then, uh, as I was saying in the previous slide, uh, we also need to take into account that in order to benefit uh, from um, the arrangements in the deal, we need to comply with new rules, which obviously uh, also uh, have an, an impact again too. And then finally, um, there are also uh, some issues. Um, that are just simply fall out of the remit of the free uh, of the trade deal of these negotiations and therefore require unilateral measures and those are issues such as the um, um, such as the third country listings that I mentioned earlier. So next slide, please. 
So what has this all meant in uh, practical terms? Well, we'll cover this in more detail during our panel discussion. But here, this slide is just to give you a flavor of the main disruption that uh, meat traders have been experiencing during these first months. And obviously, some of the disruption has been um, the need to adapt and to understand and implement the rules of origin that I've already mentioned a few times. Also, um, there has been some disruption due to the need to for hard stop of exports of some uh, fresh meat preparations due to those being uh, included on the list of restrictions and prohibitions. There has been also additional requirements for paper paperwork and preparation uh, related to yeah to new um, requirements uh, to export to the EU, including certification, and this obviously has led to increased costs both in terms of money and in terms of time, which is quite important as well, when you have a uh, just-in-time uh, supply chain. And I am just lost the slide. I don't know if uh, it's just me or I can no longer see the slides, but yeah, oh, the, here they are again. And then another point is um, another disruption uh, we've seen in the, the in relation with haulage challenges and, and transport um, difficulties uh, due to some transport models being particularly affected, uh, such as, as groupage, for instance. And finally, uh, there has been also a set of other disruptions in the borders, uh, including delays, inconsistent application of the rules, and uh, disruption in live animal trade due to lack of suitable uh, border control posts. So, next slide, please. And finally, and this is already my last slide, what are the next steps? Well, one crucial next step, uh, particularly for EU operators and UK importers, will be uh, the implementation of um, the next phases of the border operating model uh, from the UK, because as I was saying earlier, um, products going from Great Britain to uh, the EU are at the moment ex experiencing full checks and controls since day one, but that was not exactly the case for products going the other way around, from Europe to Great Britain, because the government decided to ap apply a, a phased approach um, to, to new requirements. This uh, next phase uh, will be implemented in October and in, um, at the end of the year, respectively, and, and those will mean uh, additional requirements for products going into uh, Great Britain as well. Another important next step will be for the both parties to just work on, uh, come to an agreement on, on long-term solutions uh, for uh, the issues around the Northern Ireland Protocol. And this is very important because we've had recently an, uh, an announcement by uh, the UK government on the extension of um, some grace, pre pre um, grace periods in for not, that are appraising on Northern Ireland, and that has been obviously useful for the industry, but at the same time, um, it has created tensions with the EU, and you know, tensions in the relationship are never useful for trade. And then um, ratification is uh, also a pending task for the EU, and this is important uh, because it's necessary to to kick off uh, the work of um, the new institutional framework foreseen in the agreement to manage the relationship and resolve any disputes. So I refer here to the Partnership Council and on other specialized committees and trade specialized committees that are foreseen in the in the PC in the trade and cooperation agreement. And this will be also this will play an important role in the future. So the sooner they can be set up the better. And I'll stop here. Uh, so we can move on to our panel discussion and, and, and look into some of these issues in more detail. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tanya. That's a good overview of where we are currently. You, you touched on a couple of things there of relevance, which was around the tensions and the ratification aspects of the deal. I wonder if you could just uh, comment if you feel that those current tensions 
may have implications on ratification? Well, it is true that it was due to some of these tensions and in particular due to this uh, UK decision to extend uh, some grace periods uh, in Northern Ireland that uh, the European Parliament kind of postponed a bit their decision um, for the ratification. But I wouldn't I wouldn't expect, uh, from a personal point of view, I wouldn't expect uh, this having uh, leading to a situation where the trade deal is not ratified. Basically, because as I was saying earlier, this is this was a very important um, achievement, getting a trade deal in time, avoiding a no deal scenario, and uh, we've always said that this is on everyone's interest. So I, I wouldn't expect uh, this having like major consequences of not getting a trade deal ratified, but it has obviously uh, led to, to some postponements. That's that's true. Okay, thanks thanks for that, that view. And, and thank you for your presentation, Tanya. That was excellent. Um, so I'll, I'll just introduce uh, the members of the uh, of the panel now, and and they've uh, got their cameras on, uh, which is great. So. In the order they appear, first Nudbull, who's director of the Danish Meat and Bacon Council, uh, Cormac Healy, director of Meat Industry Ireland. There we go. We've all adopted the customary webinar wave. Ian Stevenson, who's chief exec of Livestock and Meat Commission for Northern Ireland, and Rizvan Khalid, who's managing director of Euroquality Lambs uh, in, in Shropshire and exports, as I said to, to Europe in, in the beginning. So. Before we get into the panel, I, I mentioned at the beginning we're going to do some polls. So the first poll I'm going to ask you to participate in, David, if you can start to prepare that, is um, to ask you of your own assessment of the deal as it stands right now and whether you consider it to be positive, neutral or negative. So we'll just take a second to load that poll and then if you can participate uh, click on the appropriate button in your in your view. Uh, that would be helpful. We'll just take a few seconds to uh, to go through that process. Okay, that should be long enough to have, uh, to have done that, hopefully. And we click back to our speakers. So that's so that's great. Uh, what do we have? We have 19% there, so in positive, uh, neutral at 39%, and a leaning there towards uh, negative. So interesting uh, results there. Maybe we can tease out some of those points. Uh, in the panel that follows. And again, I'll, I'll remind you to um, pop in any questions that you have uh, so we can try and address those uh, before the end of the session. So um, I'm going to ask the same question to all of the speakers in the order they appear on the screen. Uh, and uh, as I said right at the beginning, this is a revisit of, of a webinar we ran before the Christmas break um, when we didn't know what it looked like. Clearly now, three months on, we do. In that first webinar, Nud also uh, joined that one uh, and asked what three issues were on his mind, and he said it was tariffs, tariffs, and tariffs. So perhaps I'll come to you first, Nud. Um, now that we know that we're we're not in that position, what's your assessment of the deal as it stands for your, uh, you know, for your stakeholders' interests? Good morning, Phil. Good morning, everyone. Uh, now to your question, how good is the deal? It is a bit as when Winston Churchill talked about democracy. It's not an ideal system, but it's the best available alternative. Uh, so it's the same way with the deal we got. Uh, it is the best among alternatives because, as you said, we avoided tariffs and quotas. Um, of course, uh, there are still things to solve. 
uh, and Tanya have touched upon it, there are some obvious mistakes I think we have to address, like the one with the minced meat with triangular trade and the meat preparations. Um, then uh, there is a big problem with the costs, uh, because of course when you hire in the UK more than 10,000 additional customs officers, that costs a lot of money. And uh, it means that in the end of the day, uh, that's an additional burden uh, to the trade. And what I would say, uh, it's a much bigger burden to small and medium sized enterprises and operators than to uh, big business. And if uh, we compare a little bit uh, the tariff we avoided, if I want to export uh, uh, hands, to UK or hands from the UK, uh, if we had had MFN tariffs, it would have been 800 euro per ton approximately. Now, if I'm a big operator exporting from the UK a container load, then the health certificate will cost me like eight euro per ton. That's 1% of what the duty would have been. If I'm, however, a small and medium sized operator who only sent 200 kilo, then I'm back to the 800 euro per ton. Uh, so I'm like burdened with 40 to 50 percent of the value. So uh, for small and medium-sized operators, uh, this uh, thing is very bad. So uh, the solution uh, for, for, for this problem is, of course, that you get into more smart systems uh, and getting the costs down. Of course, everything would also have been easier if uh, we had, like with Norway and Switzerland, the dynamic alignment of our standards but that's politically impossible. So we have to work not in traces, uh, but with a diff different system. Again, uh, we can handle that when we are big operators, uh, but I think for the small and medium size, that's also more uh, difficult uh, to, to handle. But uh, that's just to say a few uh, words uh, in, in the beginning. Uh, it is uh, not as bad as it could have been. Uh, so uh, we are confident. Okay, thank you. No, that, that's really a, an important point about the disproportionate cost impact. And I know Rizvan has some strong views from an operator's perspective of the impact it's had on its business and the associated costs. So we'll come to, to Rizvan shortly. He can perhaps pick up some of those points from a very real commercial perspective. So thank you for that, Nod. I'll come to you next, uh, Cormac, with the same uh, question. Your, your reflections on the uh, on the deal from the uh, from the republic's perspective uh yeah thanks phil and good morning to everybody i, I suppose uh i don't want to echo everything that canute has said because i agree with with uh with much of it i think uh tariffs was going to be a real concern and as i outlined at the uh the session that you organized before christmas um the tariff bill on on meat exports from ireland would have run to over 900 million euros uh, so it would have been a, a, a colossal impediment towards uh, towards trade. It, it it might have been like the uh, the ever given across the Suez Canal over the last few days in terms of its uh, of its impact. Um, so therefore, I mean, the deal compared to a no deal or a WTO scenario is is a positive. Uh, I, I'm a little bit well, I suppose, shouldn't be maybe overly surprised by the the poll. I think it's an interesting response that you've got there and and uh, tending as you say towards the towards the negative and that probably is a reflection of how people are actually feeling about practical uh trading conditions and the impacts that have been seen uh so far and as as uh, Knut has has touched on I mean, we achieved a free trade deal but we didn't achieve a frictionless trade deal uh and that certainly is playing out and I'm acutely aware too that while things have changed for us as exporters into the UK from, from that perspective, uh, we haven't yet seen the full extent of, of, uh, of the changes that have taken place that, uh, that have been experienced by UK exporters already. So we've seen the customs dimension uh, to our business that has, has added more bureaucracy and, and cost, as Knut has said, but uh, the, the export certification side uh, is is uh, is yet to come, obviously, and I know we'll touch on on that later in the in the discussion. So uh, certainly, we've 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 secured free trade, but we haven't secured frictionless trade. And what we know is that 
the new trading scenario um you know in a scenario where where we're not all part of of the single market isn't one that lends itself to the type of uh, business that we've developed in the meat side, which is just in time, uh, you know, fresh chilled delivery, next day delivery. It just is is proving very challenging for that. And and I think too, our experience also has been to echo what Knut has said that the the impact intensifies uh, as you go to uh, small and medium sized operations where the consignments uh, maybe maybe smaller. The the impact has has uh, been greatest. Uh, and we clearly see that coming through on the whole area of groupage uh, and, and the impact on transport in that regard. Thank you, Paul, Matt. So again, you know that disproportionate impact is uh, is a relevant conversation, and the certification aspects and, and dynamics, uh, you know, is going to be important going forward. So thank you for your your comments, uh, Cormac. Ian, uh, I'll come to you. From a Northern Ireland perspective, your view? Yes, thanks, Phil, and, and good morning, everybody. Um, I guess from, uh, I suppose, just picking up on our, our previous two contributors, I think um, certainly any deal was always going to be better than no deal with the European Union. I think that was certainly a mantra, you know, that, that was talked about a lot, you know, in the run-up to agreeing a deal. But from a Northern Irish perspective, you know, our situation is slightly different than that uh, of the rest of the UK due, due to the protocol. On Ireland and Northern Ireland, and I know we're going to, I suppose, explore that in a wee bit more detail later on. But I guess, I suppose, what that means on the plus side, I suppose, our meat industry here in Northern Ireland, I suppose, it gives them unfettered access to both the uh, the GB market and the EU single market. You know, um, you know, which is which is different certainly than than what I'm sure Rizvan will, will talk about in terms of the the wider experience of the UK. So our circumstances are are slightly different. So that that is a positive, I suppose, from our point of view. On the downside, I guess, as Northern Ireland being part of the UK, we're, we're effectively following the EU rulebook, uh, and that certainly is causing, you know, significant disruption to certain types of of animal and plant products, you know, coming into Northern Ireland, even with certain grace periods. And I know that's an issue we're going to talk about later. You know, to just give you one example in terms of, I suppose, our, our livestock sector, our, our, breed, our breeding sheep farmers. You know, there's been a 99% reduction. In the live imports of breeding sheep into Northern Ireland in the first two months of the year, so that that certainly will have a significant impact on the genetic improvement in our sheep industry, you know, and that's a, that's a real concern from from that sector, uh, and certainly is one of the key issues that our farm organisations have been raising. But I suppose really just to, to, to sum up, I guess you could argue, I suppose that you know whilst a, a, a trade and cooperation agreement was, was good to see that being agreed and on Christmas Eve, you know. The fact that you know there was no implementation period really for industry or for the authorities uh, to get used to the new order uh, of doing things that perhaps maybe wasn't the best way to uh, to conclude a, a deal of this magnitude without any form of implementation period. And I guess that's why we've seen grace periods and things like that being being extended. You know because just the, the challenge of implementing these changes are just so significant. So that's I suppose a, an opening assessment from a, a Northern Irish perspective. Okay, Ian. Th thank you very much. That's uh, good to get your uh, your comments. I I'm going to come to to Rizvan now, and, and Rizvan as a commercial operator. I, I wonder if you could just take a second to introduce your business for the delegates briefly, and then talk about as a as an operator with a trade to Europe, what you've experienced in those first three months, what lessons you've learned, etc. Uh, you know, what what has it felt like trying to sell your products commercially? Yeah, hi everyone. Um, my name is Rizvan. I'm MD of Euroquality Lambs. We're a large lamb exporter based in Shropshire. So 75% of our product uh, goes into Europe. We've always focused on the European market um, from, from, from our inception in 1992. Um, you know, approximately a third of UK sheep goes there. So Europe, as everyone knows, has always been very important for the sheep market. Um, our, our assessment of the deal, first of all, Phil, was one um, really of relief um, that we avoided the, the, the tariffs um, but like Ian um, uh, mentioned there just wasn't enough time to really assess um, the other impacts that were going to be uh, felt and um, in particular I mean we're a single site so we just have one species um, uh, going abroad but 
where you have smaller loads and groupage, where you have composite products, where meat is an ingredient within the product, um, it is it is a nightmare for for exporters at the moment. We know in January uh, volumes or meat volumes exporting wise from U UK was maybe 60% down. Um, it, 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 trying to adjust to the new relationship was quite difficult. So just to give uh, attendees a sort of a a, a a context over here, we we estimate for our trading relationship with our importers that there's going to be um, increased costs of circa five hundred and sixty thousand pounds per year, and that's that's pure costs in terms of veterinary inspections, export uh, customs declarations, administration, import customs declaration, import veterinary checks, Euro tunnel charges, border charges. So that's actually physical cost that's going to be added onto their training relationship. On top of that, we've already. Um, our products is getting there a day later because the time taken to prepare the documentation and the time taken to go through the border means that we're losing a day's shelf life in, in getting over there, which makes our, our, our product that, that bit less competitive. And also we've we've actually lost trade in the form of smaller customers, um, just as Nud and, and the rest of their delegates, the panelists have, have stated, whether you're selling one pallet or one load, the paperwork is the same and the costs are the same and so those smaller customers that were ordering a pallet or two pallets um of, of of product they are now are not buying they're buying directly from bigger importers so we've seen trade um starting to reconfigure between larger exporters to larger importers um, and so the the whole uh, adaption has been very very challenging Okay, Rizvan, thank you. That's that's a stark picture of the genuine impact on the the, the commercial trade. Um, perhaps we can pick up some of those points in the in the further discussion uh, that that follows. I guess just before we move into the next session, just as a bit of a a, a quick reflection, um, and I'll, I'll I'll go back to the the same order is uh, just to ask you all in turn very briefly whether there was a missed opportunity or if uh, if there was one thing you would have liked to have seen, what would that one thing be? So, uh, Nud, to you first. One thing, one missed opportunity. Yeah, one uh, missed opportunity is that uh, it was, I think, obviously a mistake uh, that uh, we have the problem uh, with the minced and the chilled meat preparations and also the fact that we cannot uh, we export to Europe, for example, trimmings from meat coming from Europe after processing in the UK. Uh, I think people had simply not thought about that that was a consequence of becoming a third country uh, on our doorstep. And I hope that that could have been uh, rectified because it gives a lot of, of problems also vis-a-vis -vis, uh, distribution to North of Ireland. Yeah. Okay, thanks. And I realise this is this question is getting more difficult, so I hope this is giving you, Rizvan, plenty of time to uh, to think and reflect in advance. So, Cormac, same question. Yeah, um, yeah I, I agree, and I, I know you're looking for one, but I mean the the anomalies that, uh, and I think that's how best to describe them. Anomalies. These were things that you know have just thrown up in relation to chilled meat preps, chilled mince, etc. Uh, that that nobody had a chance to think about or think through, which I suppose leads to the point I'm going to make. The big one of the biggest issues is that we had no time, as as uh, Bodine and 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 Rizvan have said already. I mean, effectively, uh, for businesses, they had you know six seven days between a deal being completed and uh, entry into force on the first of January. Uh, so, I mean, business um, never had a transition. At, a true transition period in all of this uh, changeover on, on any side, be it UK or EU side, our business has never had a transition period on this. We were still all waiting on what is going to be the outcome, what is is there going to be a deal, isn't there? Uh, and, and while politicians may point to various time periods and 
you know that there was a formal exit of the UK um, uh, some some uh, months previous. Uh, we really never had a proper transition period to assess uh, implications. Okay, thanks, uh, Cormac. Ian. Yeah, um, really, just to, to to add, um, I guess you know Brexit. I would say it's not a done process. You know, there's a lot still to happen in terms of negotiation of some of these anomalies, as they may be been described, and, and some of the, the difficulties around this. So I, I suspect, you know, negotiation of certain elements will go on for some time to come. But I know certainly one of the issues that you know I see being promoted actively at the moment in, in certain circles within the UK is around. A form of veterinary agreement with the with the EU, uh, and certainly that may be a an area you could say that was possibly a missed opportunity, but it's certainly something I think that could perhaps get a bit of traction, you know, over the over the coming period of time in terms of trying to, I suppose, reduce the friction and and the amount of checks and and, and etc. required at at the border. So we'll see how how that one progresses. But you know, that was perhaps a, an area that was that was perhaps missed as, as part of the negotiations. Yeah, thanks, Ian. That's a that's a really uh, a really valid point in terms of uh, veterinary type agreement. So, so Rizvan, you've got the difficult job here, but from a commercial operator's point of view, what was it that you would have uh, liked to have seen or would have done differently given the opportunity? Well, actually, Ian took the words out of my mouth. Um, in that, if if we had had a common veterinary um, area similar to what um, Switzerland have with the EU that would have negated a lot of the need for the veterinary certification and the checks at the veterinary checks at the border. Okay, the customs checks and all that would still uh, remain, but most of the friction is caused with the veterinary checks. And I think strategically, the UK, at the UK level, the veterinary side of things isn't where they want, might want to diverge on standards as such. So really, I think the opportunity is to try to align the veterinary area as much as possible to try to get that common veterinary area similar to Switzerland. So that would have been the one fundamental thing that we would have liked to see. Yeah, okay. So so there's a there's a chime of agreement there between Ian and yourself in terms of veterinary agreement. Um, so okay. Thank you very much all for you your contributions and reflections on, on those um, points. I'm now going to hand over to Tanya who's going to take us through the next bit of the uh, of the session in terms of the questions. So I'll just turn my microphone off and I'll hand to you, Tanya. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. So I would like now to focus the conversation of um, these new arrangements that we've uh, touched on uh, briefly during um, the previous session and, and their impact on, on meat trade. But before uh, turning to our speakers, we have another poll for the audience uh, again. So, um, David, if you could uh, launch uh, the poll uh, so we can um, have it on screen. And um, I, I will read, uh, as Phil uh, did, I will read uh, the question for you and the potential um, answers. And our question is basically uh, three months on. How prepared do you feel to trade under the new arrangements? And there are four options there. Uh, I feel not prepared. I've stopped operations with Europe. Still not fully prepared, but I continue trading with Europe. Then the, the third option would be somewhat prepared. Uh, I've had some teething problems, but uh, those are progressively smoothing out now. And then the fourth option, most positive one, is I'm very prepared, I have adapted well and haven't had any issue. So uh, again, we'll give you like some 30 seconds um, to reply uh, to this uh, poll and, and while you cast your votes, maybe I, I just can uh, continue the conversation um, with our speakers. Uh, so I, I'll go to, to Rizvan again first. And uh, yeah, you know, uh, Phil said it, you're here, the, the, the uh, commercial operator, the only commercial operator in the panel, and, and you already touched in the previous uh, question, you already touched a bit on um, on the, the main disruptions that uh, you have been facing as a business. So it would be interesting to see uh, 
what would you think that it will be the the in this poll? What do you th what do you think is going to be the the option that um, uh, most businesses in in Great Britain would uh, choose? Um, I would say somewhere between the second and 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 and, and third one. Um, I would expect a few to say maybe st stopping operations with with Europe, but. Uh, um, most of the teething problems, Tanya, as were, have all been resolved. It's now more structural problems. Um, the first few times a company exports, there always is a level of preparation for new processes. But once you get a few done, uh, it's, it's more the structural issues of the time delays. And I know generally for me, traders, groupage is a very big issue where there was consignments of lots of smaller lots going across where now, I mean, many hauliers have stopped taking groupage consignments because if one paperwork is wrong, the whole load will get stopped. So it's, it's a big risk for someone to be part of a groupage consignment. And um, so there are, there are lots of unintended issues or consequences because of the, the new arrangements. Tanya, you're on mute. Oh, sorry. That, that always happens. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I, I was saying that I think, um, David, it, you could launch now uh, the, the, quest, the the results of the poll to have a look at. And, and definitely you were very right, Rizman, that most of the people uh, were um, between the second and the third option, uh, which are like with slightly a bit more of people saying that they are somewhat prepared, uh, they had some teething problems, but they are smoothing out, but there are still uh, a good amount of people, 39%, that say that they are still not fully prepared, but continue to trade with Europe, and some, um, yeah, not not a five percent that also says that they are not prepared and they that they have fully stopped operations so Rizman you were really very right so thank you very much David I think you can now take that out of the screen and let's continue now um, with our European speakers so Karma and Knut um, as you've mentioned earlier, obvi earlier, obviously the situation for EU operators is slightly different because the UK is applying this phase approach to, approach to control, so uh, you haven't been faced, facing the full requirements and checks um, yet, but still, obviously, it is not business as usual. So what level of uh, disruption um, have mid traders in your specific uh, countries experienced so far? And how would you expect the situation to evolve in the coming months? Are you are your companies already getting ready for these next uh, phases um, of uh, implementation of uh, checks and controls in October and then the end of the year? So I, I will start, so, well, this question is for Cormac and Knut. Let's start uh, with Knut first for a Danish perspective from the continent, uh, from the continent and then we'll go to Cormac. Yeah, I can make it very short. Uh, <clears throat> at present, uh, we have no problems. Uh, we feel that we are prepared. Uh, we were prepared for the 1st of April, but now we can get even more prepared for the 1st of October. Uh, we, uh, of course, uh, talk a lot with our UK clients. We export to all over the place in the UK. Uh, and of course, we hear about that they are worried about uh, how to distribute to North of Ireland in the future. Um, but uh, uh, at present, uh, we uh, see uh, no problems in our export. We have a small import of products from the UK uh, to Denmark. We have not experienced problems there either. I don't know of one case where there was an error in some documents, but that was swiftly handled uh, by the authorities, so it didn't impact uh, the performance of the import. Uh, so from this side, uh, no problems. Well, that's quite positive uh, to hear, definitely. Cormac, uh, from an Irish perspective, do you agree? 
Yeah, uh, well, um, I think trade is continuing. I, I wouldn't quite agree. Um, yes, it's true, as you say, uh, Tanya, that we have had the, I suppose, the benefit of a phased approach that has been um, uh, set out by the, the UK government. Uh, that said, it isn't the case that nothing has changed. I mean, we've we've had significant change already. Firstly, with the whole revenue dimension uh, coming in and customs uh, uh, procedures being applied to to exports from uh, the beginning of the year, and the other aspect, I suppose, that impacted and concerned us quite a bit from a from an Irish perspective is the land bridge uh, and uh, transiting uh, goods across to customers in uh, in the EU, transiting the UK. Uh, and that certainly has seen changes too since the 1st of January. Um, thankfully, on, on, on one side, uh, there has been an increase in direct shipping capacity from Ireland to, to the continent, uh, principally to, uh, to France. Uh, that increased capacity has come on stream and is being used by exporters, not just food exporters, but by, by many others. But it certainly is being used by our, our meat exporters. Nevertheless, the capacity that has been brought in there hasn't been sufficient. I don't think ever could be sufficient to replace the volume of our, our trade that was using the, the UK land bridge. So it remains extremely important and will into the future. Uh, and for that, we have, I mean, the experience from exporters to date, I think, is, is, has been mixed. Um, uh, certainly transiting uh, the UK and entering the EU via uh, the Netherlands, for example, on those routes has, has uh, worked uh, more smoothly than uh, the land bridge route to France. Uh, and there are still ongoing uh, issues there for, for exporters and, and concerns around those. So we continue to work on those. On those. I think, you know, by and large, our, our main meat exporters, uh, you know, have had uh, over the years a familiarity with the customs requirements because of exports to international markets. So by and large, they were prepared for that change from the 1st of January to deal with the customs procedures. Uh, and that went smoothly. But, you know, as we've touched on already for, for smaller operators uh, and exporters, smaller consignments, uh, there, was a, there was a newness to it and, and uh, a bit of catch up to be done in the early days. I think a lot of that has, uh, has smoothed itself out. Um, one of the noticeable things that, that was happening in the early days of, uh, of, of uh, January was that you know, product was moving from from Ireland across to GB, uh, but because of challenges from the GB perspective, uh, return loads and and back loads for those hauliers became became an issue, and and it had an impact on uh, on the cost of transport. I mean, many of the hauliers were were coming back empty, uh, but that again seems to have smoothed out. As far as the next step, and we do have the next step to go. Um, I admire Canoods confidence uh, and, and positivity that they were ready for the 1st of April and no doubt they were. Um, I could say we were also hoping we were ready, um, but I, I am glad that it has been moved out from the 1st of April. I think, again, I mean, there is a certain uh, regime in place for export certification uh, and I think we we would have been largely ready, but I have no doubt there would have been some significant uh, teething problems. Uh, and one of the things to remember is that, I mean, it's it's not just uh, it's not just for meat. It's also certification for dairy, for composite goods, etc. So the the volume uh, involved of of export certification uh, is massive, and I think that's one of the particular things that. Rizvan has been calling out, and I know that has been highlighted in the recent BMPA report, that there are there are the technical issues. The first consignment that goes always brings you know new learnings, and there may be errors and 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 misinterpretations on both sides. You work through those, but then there is after all of that, there is structural change, uh, and I think in that regard, uh, we will use the time between now and the 1st of October to continue to press to make sure we have everything in place as much as possible. Uh, we will be using the TRACES system uh, for our meat um, export certification. 
uh, we need to make sure that uh, the new version of that is available before the 1st of October rather than what is being talked about now that it will be available at some stage in the later part of October. Makes no sense that we, we have a, a new system coming in maybe three weeks after that new extended deadline that the UK government has, has given. So there are all those kind of issues and I think that area of, of uh, using traces and e-certification is an area perhaps that we're not going to have resolved or, or, or clarified by the 1st of April, but I think it's an area that everyone needs to be pushing on, that we, we find ways to, to use e-certification uh, as much as possible and, and electronic transfer of documentation. I'll leave it at that, Tanya. Yeah, indeed. No, that, those are good points. And, and I'm seeing in the comments that um, there are some asking as well in the comment in our audience asking that, that we could, should consider even a further postponement of those controls to ensure uh, Christmas trade is not, not disrupted. So there's definitely uh, mixed views in terms of the level of preparedness. Um, for these next phases. So uh, we'll stay a little bit, a little bit longer in, in, in Ireland, in the island of Ireland, and but we'll go north to, to Ian. Um, obviously, Northern Ireland is in a very special situation, as we mentioned, due to the challenges of implementing the Northern Ireland Protocol. But how is it working for the, uh, and for the Northern Ireland meat industry? <clears throat> Okay, thanks, Tanya. Yes, I, I guess to put, I suppose, in context, the, the Northern Ireland situation, we, we are a small population of 1.8 million people here in, in Northern Ireland, but we produce enough food, I suppose, to feed 10 million people. So we, we have to export about 80% of, of, our, of our beef and lamb, uh, or sorry, about 90% of our, our total beef and lamb. About 80% of our beef and lamb tends to be consumed in the domestic market in the UK, with about 20% consigned to the European markets and, and some third country markets. But in, in terms of preparations and how things are working, I would say, you know, our, our red meat businesses were well prepared, you know, certainly coming into the, the start of the new regime, they, they invest a lot of time and effort and training and work very closely with our Department of Agriculture and other authorities to get as well prepared as they could be. And, and certainly they are adapting fairly well to the new arrangements in terms of, of exports and, and, and the unfettered market access. But like everywhere else, it has added extra costs into the supply chains. There's no question about that. One of the, the key elements of our, our meat processing businesses really would have been, you know, there would have been a traditional sort of movement of product around group sites, certainly within the UK, you know, where there was capacity for cutting and, and further packing and, and processing a product. And certainly significant volumes of red meat traditionally would have moved from GB into Northern Ireland. Uh, and certainly there's no grace period, periods applying to the certification of that product. So, so that, that has added a, an element of complexity, but certainly our, our businesses are, are working through that and, and certainly, you know, have been um, doing in, insofar as, as, as much as they can to make sure that, that those traditional trade flows continue. Um, perhaps one of the, I suppose, the key areas, and I think I mentioned it earlier in terms of the, the movement of, of certain goods into Northern Ireland and certain products into Northern Ireland, you know, certainly at, at farm level, I know this is mostly about meat, but it's worth reflecting at the farm level sometime as well, because it, it all feeds through into the supply chain. Certainly we've seen, you know, quite a number of farmers reluctant to send, you know, pedigree animals to Great Britain to sales, for example, you know, similar to what Cormac was saying, because there's challenges of bringing things back again, you know, if you don't sell something. So if you take a pedigree bill to a sale in, in Stirling in Scotland, for example, it doesn't sell. You have to leave it there for six months before you can bring it home again. You know, so there are certain issues around certification that that will create difficulties that will be hard to overcome. Um, but I say so far so good. Our industry has adapted well and is working through uh, the, the processes in so far as, as as they can, uh, given the circumstances. Thank you, Ian. So, Carmack, from, from the other side of the border, taking the opportunity that we have here, both sides uh, in this panel, what, what's your view uh, on, on, the, on how the, the Northern Ireland Protocol is working in practice? Sorry, I, I had muted myself. Um, well, well, look, I suppose we haven't 
today has been overly impacted by it. I mean, that's, that's uh, I suppose, should be said. I mean, uh, obviously, on the island of Ireland, uh, uh, there is movement of both livestock and product um, north, south, uh, south, north. Uh, and that continues uh, to, to flow uh, unimpeded. Um, so from, from that perspective, uh, it works. Uh, I mean, I am, I am conscious and, and aware of uh, some of the, the issues that the Northern Ireland industry has faced. And I know in the early days of January, they would have, have, have you know, highlighted that. And I think Ian referred to it earlier on, feathered access was, was what they expected. And while they may have that for consignments moving across from Northern Ireland, yeah, or from Northern Ireland directly into GB, uh, they were finding that product coming that took the Dublin route, uh, and that would be quite uh, a, a significant part of the trade of meat from Northern Ireland to, across the GB would come through Dublin uh, to serve uh, Southern Southern uh, GB customers. Uh, that, those consignments were not getting through on feather; that there were additional. Uh, layers of bureaucracy coming into it, so I'm, I'm aware of that, and we have we've equally flagged that with with our own authorities on it. But I suppose Tanya, for for in terms of the protocol, in terms of the north south, it's it you know product is 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 moving as as normal. Yeah, well, that's that's good to to hear. So, Ian, coming back to you, obviously uh, we've mentioned already some grace periods that are. Uh, at the moment being implemented in Northern Ireland to allow easier access from product going from GB to NI. Uh, but could you comment on um, on the relevance of these arrangements for the meat industry in Northern Ireland? Because these are obviously uh, meant to be temp um, temporary. And there has been some extension, um, but these are meant to be temporary anyways. So yeah, could you comment on that? Yeah, so uh, I guess looking at, at grace periods in the round, I, I would say they're apparently more relevant probably for authorised traders in the movement of retail goods into Northern Ireland. And, and certainly we have seen at retail level, we've seen some products in some retail stores no longer available because of the, the complexity of moving through certain supply chains. But, you know, we haven't seen, you know, there was, a, I suppose, an initial sort of I suppose concern about empty supermarket shelves early on in the in the process, but th those aren't happening as of now. And and we've seen some other local retailers and and wholesalers sort of helping to plug some gaps in certain product lines. Those businesses, I suppose, that are availing of the grace periods, they obviously have been advised that the scheme, you know, has been extended, you know, to the first of October. At which point, you know, there will be a phased certification process. Uh, that'll that'll be implemented, you know, unless it's extended further. Um, with regard to the the products that that Knud talked about earlier, in terms of the the chilled meats and and those restricted and and prevented products, you know, I, I guess there has been a six month grace period applying for those certainly entering, you know, from Great Britain to Northern Ireland and and certainly under some very specific conditions. Um, and you know, I guess it's been made clear that. You know that that six month period was to be used by by supermarkets to adjust their logistics and supply chains, and that at the end of that period, you know that though the products you know will probably not be allowed to enter Northern Ireland unless there is you know a a change in the in, in the, the I suppose the negotiating position. Um, I guess the the situation I suppose from a you know it, it, the protocol is quite a a political issue. Certainly, you would say at the moment within within the confines of Northern Ireland, they don't want to get into the politics of it, but but certainly at um, at last Friday's meeting, you know, I think there is an expectation, certainly within the UK, that they, they sort of indicate that there would be an agreed work program in terms of trying to work through some of the issues with the protocol. Whereas at EU level, I think they're they're keen to see a roadmap on its full implementation. So, so I think it's fair to say there's a bit of work still to be done around the, the protocol, and and certainly, you know, the grace periods, I suppose, that have been provided are welcome, and I know certainly they would be welcomed by the. I suppose the authorities here in Northern Ireland, I think I've seen a figure where for the first period of, of the year, certainly the authorities at the ports here in Northern Ireland were doing something like a fifth of all sort of, you know, checks that were having to be done on goods entering the, the single market area. So, you know, that was a huge sort of challenge for the veterinary authorities at the Northern Ireland ports and that's with grace periods in place. So you can only imagine when grace periods end what the number of checks are going to look like. So. That's a huge challenge and a huge veterinary resource, which just isn't there at the moment. So whilst they're there, you know, they, they are very welcome, I guess, for the, the period uh, ahead. 
Okay, thank you very much, Ian. Yeah, so I would like to focus now uh, our conversation um, on the future, the future prospects for EU-UK uh, trade. But before uh, going on uh, to our next set of questions, uh, I would like uh, we to, to launch our third and, and last poll for the audience, so we can also hear uh, what are the audience uh, views. So, David, please, if you could launch uh, the next poll. So, the question of the next poll reads as follows. In your view, in the medium to long term, UK meat exports uh, to the EU will likely go up, go down, and or stay the same. And this is, of course, um, maybe a bit of a what I call a crystal ball type of question, but it, it is just interesting to, to get a view of what are people's thoughts um, around future prospects. And I think, again, uh, we'll do as we did before, like we'll give a few seconds with the poll, poll on the screen to, to give you some time to reply. And meanwhile, I'll, I'll continue the conversation with our uh, panelists. So this question is really uh, for any of you. So up to now, we've been discussing some of the initial disruption caused by the new relation, by the new situation. But do you see these as teething problems, or do you foresee any other long-term implications? So um, really, I don't know who of you would prefer to to take this one. Yeah, Tanya, I'll, I'll just give uh, my view um, that Perfect. if the the things stay the same, that we do expect the exports to go down. Um, obviously, at the moment, there is the effect of the COVID pandemic, which is affecting demand both here and, and, and in Europe. So a lot of the actual true uh, trading realities is masked by the effects of the pandemic. But the way that the structural costs, the, the structural processes that exist at the moment, both in terms of costs and in terms of time delays, um, we would expect the, the volume to go down unless they are addressed. And, and in particular, this, this uh, common veterinary area is one that really needs to be looked at. Thank you very much, Rizvan. That's very interesting to get your view from a commercial perspective. I, I don't know, David, if we can now close the poll and, and show maybe the results uh oh we see we see um Rizman, the, again you are very right uh most of uh of our audience <coughs> agree with you that uh eu uh, so uk meat exports to the eu will likely uh, go down and that's 66 percent of those who have replied to, so that's quite clear so thank you david so yeah, I think on that point, Tanya, just to mention that, I mean, the, there's an element of, of preparation and, and how prepared our businesses. I think that what you're seeing is once now businesses are prepared with what the requirements are, they're now making economic commercial decisions as to whether this trade is still profitable. Um, that's where, they, where the stage is at. So that's where people are, are choosing to, to stop or to reduce certain types of exports. Um, that's once people have already tried to assess the processes and manage the processes. And what we're experiencing now on the export side, that's what our European cousins will then experience on the, on the import side in terms of how that will affect them in April, in, sorry, in October and then going forward as well. So I think it's, it's quite important to differentiate between being prepared and then the economic decisions that then follow once everyone understands the consequences of the new relationship. Oh, indeed, that's that's definitely a very valid point. Um, so I don't know if any of our other speakers would like to add something to this, or is it clear? Maybe Knut from a European perspective. Yes, <clears throat> I think when you ask about the long-term future, uh, you should uh, look at the market reality. Uh, the UK is a deficit market for pork. Uh, there need to be a supplier of around 1 million tons into the market every year. And I'm sure that uh, that level uh, will continue because there are no signs that the UK uh, self-sufficiency is going to increase. Uh, the uh, type of problems uh, we are talking about now, I, I'm sure that we'll find solutions. Uh, now, the question is, 
who will be the supplier of the 1 million tons of pork a year to the UK market. That also depends on what kind of trade deals that the UK is uh, doing with other countries in the future, uh, with countries in North and South America. And I think in particular, when it comes uh, to beef, uh, there is a strong competitiveness if those countries get uh, free access to the UK market. Uh, in pork, uh, I don't know, we uh, are used uh, from our perspective to compete with Canada and the US and others in countries like Japan, Australia, uh, uh, South Korea, etc. Uh, so I think we would also be able to be competitive on the UK market. Uh, other things uh, which may change is uh, when the UK uh, go into uh, agreements uh, with countries like the US and others, uh, will the UK uh, keep its uh, equivalent EU standards? Uh, UK are free to do whatever they want, and there will be some pressure in those negotiations uh, uh, concerning antimicrobial treatment, uh, growth promoters, uh, additives, etc. So we may end up in a situation uh, where uh, we are moving from having the same standards and getting further away from uh, the situation we would have liked to have uh, with dynamic alignment, uh, but uh, that is to be seen. So the, the short version is, and I believe at least in the pork side, uh, we will continue to maintain our export level to the UK, um, uh, even also when the UK make use of country uh, or new trade agreements uh, with other countries in the world, uh, the question may be answered in a different way in the beef. Yeah, yeah, indeed. And we will come back to the topic of um, UK um, third, uh, and deals with other third countries later. But maybe a question now uh, for Rizvan again. Uh, from a business uh, point of view, uh, how do you think that um, you and business like yours will have to evolve uh, to cope with the, these medium to long term uh, implications that we've been discussing just now? So we, we are in the process of looking at setting up a, an, an EU entity to basically act as the importer for our goods going in there. Um, we do expect that to reduce the trading costs from maybe the, the current projection of 560,000 to, to maybe around 300 odd thousand. Um, so it'll be a significant drop, but it'll still be a significant cost at the end of it. So that's one thing that we're, we're exploring, but there's lots of other implications in terms of the local um, tax and company legislation that we have to uh, explore and understand first. But that's one thing that we're looking to try to uh, mitigate the cost impact um, of the new relationship. We still see that the EU being a very strong market for British sheep. They, they do value British sheep, and we want to try to maintain and service that market as much as we can. Okay, thank you, Rizvan. So, uh, a last set of questions from me. Now, um, I'll start now with our uh, European panelists, uh, Knut and Cormac. Um, the UK is, is currently, as, as Knud uh, was also explaining, a key market for EU meat. But uh, do you expect it to change uh, Yeah, in the view of the new trading relationship? And Knud touched a bit on this, so maybe you can go again first, Knud, and then Cormac, if you want to add something. No, but as, as I said before, I don't expect uh, made a major shift uh, in, in the need to import into the UK. Uh, the market is always uh, dictating, despite what kind of bureaucracy we are running into, and we will overcome uh, those uh, uh, smaller uh, bureaucracy startup problems. Uh, and long term, we will stay constant. As I said before, the uh, question mark is uh, who is going to supply uh, this deficit into the market that depends on the character of future trade deals uh, that the UK may do with North and South America. And that is in particular, the case when it comes to beef. Okay, thank you very much, Knut. 
Cormac, uh, from an Irish perspective, uh, what, yeah, would well, you, uh, what would you say? I suppose I, I, I share that view. I mean, the market, the market hasn't changed. Uh, conditions around it, trading conditions have, have changed, but the market remains the same. Uh, the UK hasn't uh, moved location either, so it's our closest neighbour. Uh, and you trade with your closest neighbor. So, I mean, for, for those reasons, I suppose also the UK will still have an import requirement. Uh, we certainly will have an export requirement. So for all of those reasons, I think uh, UK will, will continue to be a very important market. It remains an important market within the whole European market. Let's not call it an EU market, a European meat market. The UK is a, is is still a a very important player in that market, both from import and from from an export perspective, as as uh, Rizvan has talked about. So I believe it will continue to be important. I think we we will have to see, as Knud said, what else develops in relation to the UK's own uh, bilateral trading uh, agreements in the future with other potential. Uh, global suppliers of, of meat and what uh, that may bring in terms of changes in the market or different competition or different competitive pressures. But for the for the short to medium term, it certainly is uh, going to continue to be an important uh, market for us. Thank you very much, Carmack. And, and now a similar question uh, to Rizvan and, and Ian, but this time from a UK perspective. Um, do you foresee the UK exporters shifting their attention to other areas of the world, given the trade friction they are facing now um, with Europe, and and the new and also given the new trade deals that the UK is negotiating with other third countries? So we can go maybe first with Brisbane and then with Ian for a specific Northern Ireland perspective. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, Phil touched upon the Open Doors campaign that DIT is running in, in the UK. That's important to open up other markets around the world. Uh, lamb as, as, a, as a protein is in short supply around the world, so there are opportunities elsewhere. But our, our product is uh, at a premium placement compared to the other uh, uh, big lamb exporters, such as Australia and New Zealand, um, on the world market. And we'll be positioned such that our, our volumes will not be high going into any markets because the New Zealanders and Australians are already in those in those markets. So the volumes that we'll be able to export to other markets um, will be res will be restricted. Uh, but that's not to say there isn't opportunities. But the first step is for the government to open up, particularly the markets like China and the U.S., uh, where there where there is some opportunity there to to increase the trade. I would say on the wider meat side, there's definitely opportunities around the world as global middle class is growing. Um, but they, I think it's important to recognize that the rest of the world hasn't suddenly become easier. It's just that now going to Europe is the same as going to the rest of the world. So in, in, in a way, the processes are now the same whether you go to EU or the rest of the world. It's not that the rest of the world has become any easier. You still have the, the challenges of logistics. You still have the challenges of of, of language and and, and culture. Um, so, whilst there will be some opportunities over there, I think they uh, the realistic um, uh, target in those mar markets it, it wouldn't uh, surpass what we have in in the EU. Thank you, Rizwan. Uh, Ian, um, do you want to add something? Yeah, certainly from a from a Northern Irish point of view, certainly the view of our, our meat exporters has, has always been, well, I guess since the beef export ban was lifted in 2006, certainly the view has been to try and get as much market access as possible around the world, as opposed to sell every component of the carcass that can be sold in the best paying markets available. So I think that that continues to be, the I suppose, the general ethos. Um, our businesses have been, I suppose, growing their exports to some third country markets in recent years, in particular, you know, through Hong Kong and North America and the Middle East and, and some African nations. But I guess those markets will never replace the fresh, chill trade in domestic and, and EU markets that I suppose where the vast majority of our of our of our meat goes to. So that'll always be, I suppose, the core focus of our businesses. But but certainly as markets, particularly in Asia, particularly Asian markets, as they continue to grow, certainly in terms of their demand for meat, 
uh, and also the opportunities in those regions open up as you know consumer purchasing power improves you know certainly there will be an interest in trying to access you know more opportunities there and, and certainly well, hopefully china will be the next biggest prize i guess for for uk exporters if, if we can get that one across the line certainly you know i think rizvan has mentioned some of the, the key opportunities in, in north america as well so you know i think there's a there's a keenness to look at those markets as and when they become available and certainly it's one not to lose sight of you know if we can get that market access improved thank you very much ian so um on uh, more on this topic we are receiving some questions from the audience so um i'm gonna i'm gonna ask you now and i guess this is uh maybe for Carmack, but also Ian, um, well, let's see, I'm going to read it out loud so you can have a look and and, and you can take the floor if, if you feel that you can provide an answer. So the question is, what strategic change are the big Anglo-Irish meat processors that operate in Ireland and the UK likely to take, especially if faced with increased competition from the rest of the world exporters? So I don't know if oh, who of you would prefer to take the floor. I can. I mean, I I can uh, maybe start start on that, uh, Tanya. I mean, I suppose, firstly, from from an overall perspective from the Irish sector. I mean, you know, once the Brexit vote took place and throughout the whole process of uh, of the negotiations, which which uh, which ran for four years. Um, I mean, we had always been clear that we continue to believe that the UK market is central to us. It's our next door neighbor, it's our closest market, the, the strong linkages are there. So that everything and anything that we do should try to maintain our position and our, our share in that market. Uh, that's that's about being as, as competitive as possible. It's about being uh, having the the uh, the strongest relationships possible with customers and the customer base there, and having an offering that that you know continues to engage the customer, uh, that that doesn't change. Uh, clearly, throughout throughout the the the, uh, the last four years, there's been a renewed effort on uh, on international market access, knowing that there will be perhaps uh, changes in the UK market where there will be greater competition. Uh, maybe you know some pointed to and asked questions uh, as to whether or not our overall reliance uh, on the UK market was was too high. I mean, it, it certainly was over 50% of our beef was going to the to the UK market, and there were questions raised around whether our reliance was in any event was too great on one single market. Um, but you know, I, I still see it accounting for a major proportion of our our beef exports. But we have pushed to try and develop the alternative market access uh, options available to us. But equally knowing that none of those uh, will deliver the kind of returns uh, that the UK market by and large can, I mean, can return. It's still a high priced, high value uh, premium market. Uh, and I mean, there is also the fact that it's different type of cuts and different parts of the carcass that you're going to be uh, shipping perhaps to some of the new developing markets in in, in Asia and, and wherever else. So uh, we, I think we continue to work to make sure that the offering that is available and, and presented to UK customers is as strong as possible. Uh, and uh, at the same time, as every other industry that's on the call here from, from whatever uh, origin, we all want to have as many markets open to us as possible to ensure the best possible carcass balance. Yeah, indeed. This this is definitely a very valid point. Thank you very much, Cormac. So we have another uh, question from the audience, um, in particular uh, regarding comments that have been made uh, uh, regarding the co uh, the common veterinary area and. They are asking, is agreeing a common veterinary area achievable in the current political climate? So um, I think it was Ian who mentioned uh, this earlier, uh, and Rizvan, any of you would like to, to, to have a go at this question? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't see why it wouldn't be, Tanya. I know there has been some... Um, exploration from the from the British perspective on some other standards where where it could 
deviate from from the EU norms. But um, mm. on, on the whole, the, the veterinary and the food standards will be very heavily aligned, if not in um, um, wording, but very much in in in, in principles. Um, so I think that the opportunity is there. Um, I don't think there's a lot of opportunity for divergence. Um, so I think it's just a the government policymakers to have a look at this to sort of see that can we do this because it would make a, a major difference to both the import for which we are a heavily importing country as as the UK as well as the 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 export. So I think that for the for the wins that we'd get from having a common veterinary area, um, uh, it, it's definitely worth the policymakers looking at this. I don't know what Ian thinks about it. Yeah, no, other than I guess, um, I, I know that the British Meat Processors Association published a very insightful report last week, certainly looking at the, I suppose, the impact of Brexit, you know, three months on, uh, and certainly as part of one of their solutions to the, I suppose, the systemic rather than teething problems that were identified in that report was really around a number of options, looking at the potential of that, you know, veterinary agreement, you know, there, there are a number of options for that. So I think that I think you'll see a bit of conversation on that, you know, in, 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 the, in the months and weeks ahead. But the, the whole political environment, I guess, around sort of Brexit has become a bit tense, certainly around, you know, COVID-19 vaccinations, as you mentioned earlier, and the potential triggering of the Article 16 agreement here in Northern Ireland, which caused all sorts of of, of, of people to, 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 to raise all sorts of issues around, around the whole process. So, you know, I guess things, you know, are a bit tense in terms of the, the negotiations between the EU and the UK around certain issues. But I suppose when you look at the cold, hard facts on the ground and what's happening on the ground, you know, there there possibly will be room for for, for negotiation of some of these these issues. I think they'll have to be, you know, once the full application of controls are applied at both within the UK and the EU, just the, the challenges of making that work in practice, I, I think you'll you'll find the, the, the scope for negotiating some of these things will improve. Okay, Ian, okay. thank I, you very much for that. I and thank you, you very much for all of, uh, of our speakers. I think I'm conscious of time. Oh, sorry, Cormac, did you want no, to I, add something? I, I was just going to say, I mean, I, I think too that the, the, the way you asked the question kind of framed it in, in a particular way that, uh, you know, is it achievable in the current political environment? We have to keep pushing. I think that we're talking about business uh, and the business and trading environment uh, and work on things like uh, the various anomalies that have been there uh, that we've talked about earlier in terms of chilled product, work on, on whether there's practical solutions around groupage of sealed pallets etc i'm not sure does that work or does it really solve it but we have to be able to uh to explore those and and even look like things just practical things of whether or not we can use traces i mean between us i mean that will ease ease uh, operations for both uk exporters and and eu exporters into the uk so i mean i think we have to keep it focused and we have to keep pushing the agenda of the uh, the business uh in, and trading environment Indeed. So again, thank you very much. Thanks, Cormac, and all of our speakers for your insights and your time today. I think it has been a very interesting discussion. I'll now pass uh, over to, to Phil for the concluding remarks because I, I'm aware we are running out of time. Thank you. Uh, th thanks, Tanya, uh, and thanks again. I think good point there, really, Cormac, to kind of bring that session to a close is the importance of ongoing trade. Uh, in whatever guise and to continue to push for for the most appropriate, most workable, most practical uh, kind of agreement and ongoing um, uh, business uh, both in and out of UK and Europe and further afield. So just want to pick up on a few of the key points that were, were raised during that discussion and Ian and Cormac raised the market access opportunities. Of course, growing access is a, is a is also a critical thing to increase those opportunities and carcass balance and, and add to opportunities and mitigate risk. And of course, we, we live in uh, uh, volatile times. Rizvan's comments around uh, exporters being equipped for the future, that may mean that, uh, that exporters are, are, are more able or more encouraged to look to further third country type markets and broaden their export reach. But I mean, it will remain a fact that the EU is our nearest market, most valuable, we're most well established, et cetera. And particularly for businesses like Rizvans, they built up significant commercial trade and reputation in that area. And uh, 
you know that's that's hard uh, hard won uh, and easily lost so you know that we must continue to try and exploit those opportunities and from our own experience and our teams based in France and across Europe you know they're committed to uh, continuing to, to support uh, exports uh, to the region uh, and then Nud's point we are we will the UK will remain a net importer so clearly ongoing trade and frictionless or trade with as little friction as possible is going to be critical going forward so I think some really good discussion there and some key points but we're all pretty much landing on the same place which is that ongoing trade is important and we need to make sure that it's as viable and as realistic as possible for all businesses whether they be smaller businesses shipping in pallets or larger businesses shipping in loads because the costs associated with that are disproportionately impacted both smaller businesses so with that I'd like to take the opportunity to formally thank all the speakers for their insight and input representing their own sectors or their own geographical regions that that's been excellent discussion and debate and thank you as delegates for joining I, I would like to ask you to when the webinar ends there will be a short uh, survey in terms of uh, how useful you found this webinar and I, I would appreciate you uh, taking just a second to, to fill that in because it informs what we might do going forward. Um, the video will be available within the next 24 hours and will be sent to you and again you'll be able to share that with your colleagues and slides will be made available online. So on behalf of AHDB and the export team I would like to thank all our speakers and you as attendees. I hope you found it useful and I wish you a very good afternoon. Thank you.